Good morning, friends. We've got lots to get done today, so let's just dive right in. Early this morning at about 6.30 a.m., I took a bunch of cuttings from my zinnias because I wanna go ahead and propagate them and have more seed to collect this fall. And it's really easy to propagate zinnias by asexual propagation. That is taking a cutting of the parent plant and producing an exact clone via the cut material. So in the past, we've covered using the pinched portion of a branching annual as cutting material. We've done that with snapdragons, we've taken dahlia cuttings, we took cosmo cuttings a long time ago. And for that, you take the very top part of the plant earlier on in the growing season. Now these plants were never pinched. They've already flowered. I've been cutting them and using the flowers for flower arrangements. So what I'm gonna do instead is take side cuttings. But I wanna do the same exact thing as if I was doing a pinch. I wanna get two to three nodes. So I'm just gonna cut into this plant here. Now I want to remove these lower leaves. That's the node where I just took the leaves off from. Now I wanna cut just below that node. I just don't really need this stem to be under the soil surface. It's more important to me that this node is below the soil surface. Some people will now cut these leaves in half because this cutting is going to be rapidly losing water. And so if it has less leaves to hydrate, it can focus more of its energy on putting roots down. You could even remove these altogether. So there's my cutting. Now I can just either stick it directly into potting soil or I can dip the node and the base of the cutting into rooting hormone. That just helps speed up the process. You don't need to buy rooting hormone for this, but if you have some on hand, I would go ahead and use it. Now you can do two things with this tray of zinnias. The less stressful way is to put your tray of cuttings under grow lights and run the lights for 16 hours a day. That's what I've always done in the past. If you watch older videos where I'm propagating snapdragons, cosmos, dahlias, any kind of branching annual, I prefer to put them back under lights and then grow them on inside. In about two to three weeks, they'll be ready to come back outside, be hardened off, and then be planted out into the garden. However, all of my grow lights are in use right now. I have cool flowers under all of them. So I'm choosing to grow these cuttings on, on my covered porch. I wanna place the cuttings in full shade, all day shade, no sun at all, until they have a full root system on them. If I was to put my tray of cuttings into the sun or um, into an area where I got a couple hours of sun during a day, it's really gonna cause so much stress to this cutting. It's going to transpire even more rapidly. Transpiration is the loss of moisture through the leaves and that cutting is probably going to fail. But if you place them in a full shade location, water them daily, maybe even twice a day, depending on your climate, you can get them to root outside in that full shade location. So friends, that's really all there is to it. And I'll put links to my other videos where we do asexual propagation of other branching annuals. So you can kind of see this process from start to finish, but I'll also be updating you repeatedly on how these particular cuttings are doing. But now that we've got that done, I need to get started on my main work day. So let's head inside. I have a custom arrangement to do, and then I wanna make some really interesting hot sauce for my husband, which I hope will taste good. All right, sorry, I lied to you. I wanna share one more thing with you. If you really love zinnias, and of course they're becoming even more popular in the last few years, I would really recommend this book. It's called The Zinnia Breeder's Handbook by Tiffany Jones. It talks all about the different forms, how to propagate them different ways, how to breed them, of course. She covers basically what I shared with you today. She takes the cuttings a little bit differently than I do. Both ways work. She covers um, doing the cuttings in rock wool, if that's something that you're interested in doing. So I think there's about two to three pages on zinnia propagation. 
Oh, she also goes over layering of zinnias as a form of propagation, which sometimes just naturally happens out there in the garden. But this is not an expensive book at all. It gets right to the point. It's easy to understand, and I would recommend it. So I'll put a link to this in the description section below. Okay, now let's get to work. Okay, time out again for this little moth here. So today we're working with these beautiful Vincent sunflowers, three different kinds of a spike celosia. We've got some eucalyptus. Our straw flower is still producing, so thankful for straw flower. And then just a few stems of lisianthus. So I'll make the large arrangement first, which is the anniversary arrangement, and then I'll check back in with you. Now these custom arrangements are three times the size of my normal roadside stand arrangements. So that has 15 sunflowers in it. And we also put the lisianthus and the straw flower in that one. And then here's ones I did for the roadside stand. So those only have three sunflowers in the front. No lisianthus, no straw flower, but still beautiful bouquets. And now we just wait for our customer to arrive. But this really puts me in the mood for fall. I can't wait for things to cool down, make lots of apple cider, apple pies, and everything pumpkin related. While we wait for my customer to arrive, let's go ahead and harvest some Coosa dogwood berries and some habanero, cayenne, and jalapeno peppers from my husband's rooftop garden because I want to surprise him with this kind of weird hot sauce. So almost every single day for the last probably two or three weeks, I've been making all different kinds of hot sauces. I went on Amazon, bought a big box of bottles, and I found this really cool website. Um, I'll make sure and link it in the description section. I think it's called Chili Pepper Madness. And he has all these awesome hot sauce recipes. I've been trying all of them. And my husband and I love hot sauce. We have it every single morning with eggs. So my thought behind using the Kusa dogwood berries and the hot sauce is that Kusa dogwood berries kind of taste like a mild peach. And one of our favorite hot sauces that I've made so far has a handful of frozen peaches in it. So I'm just gonna sub out that handful of frozen peaches for Kusa dogwood berries that are peeled and we'll see what happens. I've heard that some people make jellies with Kusa dogwood berries, but they are a little bit time consuming to peel. So I'm hoping that by only needing a handful versus a big bucket, that it'll still be a good way to use them without all the labor involved in making jelly. Now I have eaten them just like this and I would not recommend that. The texture of the skin is very weird. I would definitely say to go ahead and peel them. This is the first time I've actually seen the keyhole garden from up above. That's kind of a cool view. Here's what the kusa berries look like before you peel them. Here's what they look like after. And this is about how many I'm gonna add in, just a small handful. And if you didn't have this, I would just add in a handful of peaches. So in here I have 18 habaneros, eight jalapenos, three cayams, three fourths a cup of red wine vinegar, two teaspoons of salt, and a whole head of fermented black garlic. So now what I'm gonna do is put these kusa berries in here. I'm gonna put it on my stove. I'm gonna bring it to a boil and then turn it down and simmer it for 20 minutes. All right, the hot sauce report from my husband is that it's delicious, but he can't really taste the Kusa dogwood. He says that he senses a little bit of sweetness in the sauce and he likes that, but that when I put the peaches in, he did prefer that flavor. So if you have a favorite hot sauce, please let us know. I do have enough time to head over to Longwood Gardens and show you a few of the gardens. So let's just grab a snack because I've been smelling peppers all day, but I haven't actually eaten anything. So let me go ahead, cut these apples up, make sure there's no earwigs leave, living inside, and then we'll head over to Longwood and take a look at some of these cool gardens. 
So let's start here at the Rose Garden. I don't think I've ever showed you this garden before. And we're entering it from the Topiary Garden. I love the combination here of the Creme Caramel Coreopsis. And then they have this beautiful yellow rose here. And the name on this one is Winter Sun. Backed up with a beautiful yew hedge. And I love the stonework in this garden. The central path straight ahead leading towards that horn beam. And then the path branches off and circles in two different directions. And I also really like how they use a lot of wispy textures with the roses. That kind of creates a more informal feel versus pairing roses with boxwood or lots of other evergreen hedges. I also see that they're repeating a few of the same roses. This one is called Polar Express. Really wonderful fragrance on that. I love this yew hedge running through the bed. The gara is so beautiful, isn't it? This is a white gara called Whirling Butterflies. Down here we have some carpet roses. It looks like this one is Oh So Easy Urban Legend. Backed up with grasses and echinacea. I'm also seeing a lot of that clematis. What is it called? Stand by me clematis that you have to stake up. See some there? What do you guys think about that clematis? Penstemon. This one is called Celestial Night. They have this beautiful seating area up here. We can travel up there together. So if we go out this pathway, it leads us to the topiary garden. But I wanna take you up this stairway so that you can see the rose garden from up above. It is a hot and sunny Pennsylvania day. I think 94 degrees today, so I'm glad we got those flower orders taken care of early. So here we are up on the perch, looking down on the rose garden. And you can also see the fountains there in the distance. Isn't that gorgeous? So here's another garden room that's enclosed by hornbeam, underplanted with geranium. And I love this garden room because it just features really big pots with tropical plants, annuals, and even some evergreens and trees. So it's just a really fun use of pots, a great showcase of what grouping pots together can do for a space. It gives you this wonderful movable picture. So we've got some heavenly bamboo here, sweet potato vine, different kinds of elephant ears and cannas, bananas, just a great use of texture and keeping the color palette really simple is so beautiful. Look at the color on that coleus. Isn't that fantastic? Right behind that, a gorgeous begonia. Dancing peacock begonia, it says. Here's a look at the other side with an absolutely stunning weeping blue atlas cedar. You can hear the chimes ringing in the background right now teacup elephant ears right there. Silver dichondra, silver falls is the cultivar. And it says, which container is your favorite and why? What do you think? What's your favorite container? These elephant ears seem to be planted just in water. 
weeping beach there in the background. I just love this room, don't you? Let me know what your favorite room is here at Longwood. So now we're going to leave the container garden room and enter another new space. This garden used to be the herb garden and now they've turned it into an idea garden that's just jam packed full of what mainly appears to be annuals, some perennials, and just full on color. It almost seems like the color palette here is yellow, pink, and red with a touch of dusty blue. Really beautiful gomphrina. What do you guys think about this coleus? Do you like it? Do you recognize the cultivar? Please let us know in the comment section below. Some beautiful salvias backed up with grasses. And you can see the vegetable garden there in the distance. Some huge bananas in the distance also. I see Mahogany Splendor Hibiscus here on the right hand side of your screen. Back planted with a sweet potato vine and some Rebecca. Looks like compact pink Sun Patience. Friends, feel free to correct me at any time if I say anything wrong. I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head here from what things look like. Here's another collection of pots in the corner. Kind of stops traffic there. That's a nice idea. More mahogany splendor hibiscus right next to some eucalyptus. And the birds really seem to be loving that coreopsis. So I think these plants just repeat over and over again with the marigolds, the rubecchia, the coreopsis, the gomphrina. And then there in the middle, I see some huge bananas, cannas, coleus, and more sun patients. So we visited the new cut flower garden earlier this season, but I see some new things that are worth pointing out, some things that some of us might wanna grow in the years to come. First, I wanna stop by this Sunday Salosia because it's looking so beautiful and I remember, and you can even see two remaining there. They had this interplanted with the Peter Pears gladiolus. And look at these double click cosmos. So it looks like they've been cutting on the straw flower And I would love to ask for your help here. Is this white hyacinth bean vine? I didn't even know that was a thing, but on the right we have purple hyacinth bean vine. I have never seen or heard of white hyacinth bean vine. Is that what we're looking at right here? If so, I need to get my hands on some seed for that because that is beautiful. I think what's edging this Order here is the toothache plant. I'm not sure what the botanical is for that, but check out this celosia, this awesome brainy orange celosia. It says it's called Orange Queen Improved. Interplanted with Fire King, a pincushion flower. And I think as we head this corner, we start to hit some vegetables interplanted with cut flowers. So we're seeing Nicotiana planted with what looks like bright light Swiss chard. I'll tell you what, I grew that at work and it was destroyed by bugs. I could not get any usable Swiss chard that year. And I love this back row a very informal planting of zinnias, eurygium, lilies. 
What is this down here? Does anyone recognize this plant? Is it some kind of Angelonia? 